Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 93, STS-51L Part 2, A Cold Day in January. Last time, we learned about the 25th flight of the Space Shuttle, and the 10th flight of OV-099 Challenger, STS-51L. Or at least, we learned about the mission that should have happened. We met the crew, inspected their payload, and in a dream of what was to be, we watched along with millions of schoolchildren as Krista McAuliffe touched the future by teaching from space. Today, we will steal ourselves and dive into the stark reality of the STS-51L mission that actually happened. On the morning of January 28, 1986, the crew was awoken for another launch attempt. This was now a familiar routine since the mission had already suffered a number of delays and scrubs. In fact, the launch was already delayed by an hour due to tanking issues, and soon by a second hour due to concern expressed by the PAD ICE team. As the crew walked down the ramp out of the Operations and Checkout building, their spacecraft Challenger was already fueled and waiting just seven miles away at Launch Complex 39B. The mission was notable for being the first shuttle to launch from 39B, and the first launch of any kind from that pad since the Apollo-Soyuz test project over ten years earlier. The morning was unusually cold for Florida, with temperatures remaining below freezing overnight. The crew was driven to the pad, climbed aboard their spacecraft, strapped in, and waited for the countdown clock to reach zero. At 11.38 a.m., it did just that, and Challenger roared off of the launch pad. For the next 73 seconds, the flight appeared normal in every way, even to mission controllers at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, with their endless streams of telemeter data, nothing seemed amiss. But at 11.39 and 14.1 seconds, downlink from Challenger was lost. Radar showed multiple objects where only one had been a moment before, and mission controllers and spectators alike looked up to their monitors, trying to make sense of the sight before them. Where there had once been a space shuttle stack tearing its way towards orbit, there was now a large cloud with two white smoky trails continuing upward out of it, and numerous smaller trails tracing out a parabola in the upper atmosphere, bending to gravity's will and returning to Earth. A stunned public affairs officer commented simply, Obviously a major malfunction. The image of Challenger's destruction in that January sky has sadly come to be one of the most well-known images associated with spaceflight, and one of the most well-known images to the United States in general. The presence of teacher in space Krista McAuliffe on the flight ensured that, despite waning interest in the now seemingly routine shuttle launches, millions of people were watching live on television. Every time I watch the footage, every time, I can't help but hear a small voice in the back of my head think, maybe it'll be okay. But it wasn't. Challenger was destroyed, the crew was lost, and seemingly with no warning, NASA found itself facing its greatest crisis in 20 years. What happened? Well, the short answer is that the aft field joint of the right-hand solid rocket booster failed due to cold temperatures that resulted in a less pliable rubber O-ring. A plume of hot gas escaped the joint and impinged on the external tank, leading to its structural failure, which then led to the structural failure of the orbiter due to excessive aerodynamic forces. The longer answer is quite a bit more involved. Before we get to the longer answer, there's something I want to get completely out of the way before we start walking through the disaster millisecond by millisecond. Crew survivability. It's the most obvious thing in the world to ask what could have been done to save the crew, and it's the most natural thing in the world to wonder what the crew experienced as Challenger fell. I don't want to dwell on this, but it's clearly an important part of the story, so we will take a few minutes examining it. Starting on STS-5, shuttle crews had been traveling through launch and entry wearing simple flight suits and helmets. This was a departure from the fully pressurized spacesuits worn by all previous American space crews. The reason for this is that pressurized suits are cumbersome, uncomfortable, expensive, and can be dangerous in their own way. With the Space Shuttle Orbiter providing a shirt-sleeve environment, the thought was that pressurized suits were no longer required. This lack of pressurized suits is a key factor in how events unfolded. 
When the spacecraft disintegrated, for reasons we'll talk about shortly, the forces were not as severe as you might imagine. The estimate is that the largest forces were on the order of 12 to 20 Gs. We know this from onboard sensors, as well as analysis performed on launch imagery and recovered debris. 12 to 20 Gs is a significant amount to pull, but since it only lasted for a few seconds, it was unlikely to seriously injure the crew. However, it was sufficient to separate the crew cabin from the main fuselage and forward structure such as the RCS module. This meant that the cabin's air supply was severed. It is also very likely, though impossible to know for sure, that the crew cabin was breached, leading to rapid depressurization. The breakup began at 48,000 feet, with the crew cabin continuing to 65,000 feet, over 12 miles. That's more than twice the altitude of Mount Everest. At those altitudes, hypoxia, the lack of oxygen to the brain, sets in fast. In the past, I've imagined high-altitude hypoxia to just be the sudden absence of oxygen, meaning you could still hold your breath and have a minute or two of useful consciousness. At these altitudes, it doesn't work like that. If the crew was indeed exposed to the ambient pressure outside the crew cabin, they would have only had a few seconds of consciousness. Each crew member carried an emergency air supply that led into their helmets, but their purpose is often misconstrued. This was not pressurized oxygen for survival purposes at altitude. Rather, it was regular air provided in case of a gas leak during an emergency crew egress on the pad. I say their purpose has been misconstrued because it has been reported, correctly, that four of these air supplies were recovered and that three of them had been activated by the crew. This was likely done as a quick response by the well-trained crew, but would not have helped them. There are other indicators that the crew quickly lost consciousness. Analysis of the wreckage suggests that all seats were occupied with the harnesses locked at the time of impact. There's no way to know how the crew would have reacted if they were conscious, but my bet would be that at least one would have gotten out of their seat. According to the findings of Joe Kerwin, Skylab astronaut and biomedical specialist, the cause of death of the crew cannot be precisely determined due to the extreme force with which the cabin struck the ocean. We will simply never know how they died and how aware they were of what was happening. I choose to believe the plausible and likely outcome that the crew rapidly lost consciousness immediately after their spacecraft broke apart. In that case, what happened between that moment and the crew cabin's impact with the ocean is not important. In order to understand the technical details of the accident, we first need to better understand the design of the solid rocket boosters. We went into more detail in episode 64, Shuttle Components, but let's do a very brief overview of what makes up the SRB. Starting at the top, we find the nose cap, frustum, and forward skirt. This area basically contains utility stuff that the SRB requires to do its job. Equipment to ignite the motor, small rockets to push away from the external tank at separation, and equipment to support SRB recovery, like parachutes, flotation gear, and flashing lights. Continuing on, we find the main part of the solid rocket booster, the solid rocket motor. This is the part of the SRB that actually provides propulsion. It was a large cylinder filled with roughly 1 million pounds of solid propellant. The burning propellant created hot gas, which was forced down the motor to the next element, the nozzle. The nozzle was actually trickier than you might think, since it had to directly withstand the punishment of the exhaust gas and pivot from side to side to help steer the stack. Because the fully assembled SRB was too big to transport, it was only partially assembled at the factory with final assembly performed on-site at the Kennedy Space Center. Put another way, the assembly was done in the field, so the joints were called field joints. This is in contrast to the joints that were sealed at the factory, which were called factory joints. Both joints worked the same way, but the factory joints had an additional layer of thermal insulation inside, I believe simply because there was more support equipment available at the factory. Each SRB had three field joints that were assembled at the Cape. Understanding the structure of these field joints is critical to understanding the story of the Challenger accident. 
I found this is a little tough to do verbally, but I'm going to do what I can, and in the process, prove the adage that a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, in this case, about 400. If you're able to, you'll probably want to check the show's Twitter feed, at Space Above Us, for an image depicting the joint. Or if you're listening to this in the future, and I finally got around to making it, the show notes page at thespaceabove.us should have the same picture. When imagining an SRB segment, imagine a gigantic can of soup. But imagine it was open on the top and bottom, and instead of soup, it was full of solid rocket propellant. Black rubber material with a big hole down the center to let the gas out. When you stack one soup can on top of another, that ridge on the bottom of the upper can sort of slots into the groove on the top of the lower can. That's actually pretty close to the SRB field joint. To be a more accurate model, the groove would need to be deeper, almost like a tuning fork, and the ridge would need to be a little longer. But the image gets you most of the way there. This is called a tang and clevis joint, with the tang being the ridge and the clevis being the groove. Once the two segments were connected together, hundreds of metal pins would be slotted through holes that were perpendicular to the skin of the cylinder. Continuing with the soup can analogy, imagine you somehow put tiny nails through the connected ridge and groove all around the circumference of the can. This creates a perfectly good structural connection, but that's not good enough. The problem here is that we don't just need the connection to be structurally sound, but also airtight. Airtight against extremely pressurized hot gases. When the two segments are fitted together, you end up with a small gap between the block of propellant in the upper and lower segments. Left unchecked, a hot gas would get into this space, work its way to the edges, force its way into the small space between the tang and clevis, and out the side of the SRB. To prevent this, the space between the propellant blocks was filled with inhibitor material, and the area near the joint was stuffed with special heat-resistant putty. And critically, along the exterior face of the inner prong of the groove, facing the upper segment's ridge, were two small slots that were occupied by thin rubber O-rings, each about a quarter of an inch thick. To hopefully help you visualize this, imagine that tiny rubber bands were stretched along the inside of the soup can groove. As the ridge of the upper can is lowered into place, the O-rings are smushed into their slots, creating a seal. That's basically the SRB field joint a metal ridge slotted into a metal groove with rubber rings smushed along the side of the interior to prevent gas from getting through. Okay, so now we have a simplified view of how the joints were made, but how are they supposed to work? When the SRB ignited, it would swell like a balloon, just a bit, due to the intense pressure of the combustion taking place inside. The original intent was that this slight motion would cause the joint to clamp down even tighter. Critically, due to a design flaw, it actually did the opposite of this, slightly pulling the O-rings away from the surface they were smushed into. But that wasn't the end of the story. To help protect the O-rings, heat-resistant putty was applied in the small space between the joint and the main combustion chamber. At ignition, hot gases in the booster would push up against the putty, which would push on the air between the putty and the primary O-ring, which would push the primary O-ring into its proper position. The primary O-ring had to be pushed into position because despite it being a tight fit in there, there was a little room for it to move around in its slot. When the joint was tested for leaks, air was forced into the space between the primary and secondary O-rings. This pushed the secondary O-ring down where it was supposed to be, but pushed the primary O-ring up to the top of the slot. But at ignition, thanks to the combustion gas pushing on the putty, pushing on the air, the O-ring was pushed down into place. The ring extruded into the gap, and the seal was formed. On the previous 24 flights, even if the gap the rings had to fill was slightly larger due to the slight rotation of the metal at pressurization, the seal had held. One problem with this system is that during the assembly process, as the two segments are connected, any air in the joint sort of whooshed out, creating small holes in the heat-resistant putty called blowholes. These holes were random, difficult to discover, and created a direct path from the hot combustion gases to the O-rings. 
If I understand correctly, this would work even with normal rubber O-rings, because once the joint was sealed, there was no reason for the gas to force its way over there anymore. It was easier to just rush down the hole and out the nozzle. If it didn't work, then we had a problem. Because if the hot gases reached the O-rings while there was a gap in the joint, the gases would rush over them and begin burning the rings away. This is called blow-by, and it's what I've been mentioning here and there throughout this phase of the shuttle program. Several flights had exhibited small amounts of O-ring erosion, with soot being found in the space between the two rings. There had even been cases where both the primary and secondary rings were damaged, but the seal had always held. The reason I've gone to all of this trouble to explain the physical structure of the joint and how it's supposed to work is that you hopefully now understand the all-important sealing mechanism. The joints weren't automatically sealed. At ignition, at the same time that the gap was getting wider due to the SRB slightly expanding and the joint design flaw, the O-ring was just sitting there, waiting to be pushed into place by gas and putty. And most critically to the story of the Challenger accident, the speed at which the O-ring was pushed into place and extruded into the gap, filling it, was intimately tied to the temperature of the ring. The colder the ring was, the less pliable it was, and the less responsive it was, taking slightly more time to smush into place. In those precious tenths of a second, combustion gas could find its way down a putty blowhole to the O-ring, rush past it, and damage it. One thing I misunderstood about blow-by, and I believe I have correct now, is I always imagined it as a process that took place over the entire SRB burn. But really, it's a very short event, right at ignition. In a flash, gases would rush out and lick at the O-rings, the rings would seal in place, and the burn would continue like normal. We now have enough information and context to describe what happened on STS-51L. On January 28, 1986, at 11.38 a.m., the SRB Ignition Command was issued, and the mission was underway. Imagery later revealed that less than seven-tenths of a second later, smoke could be seen above the aft field joint of the right-hand solid rocket motor. Eight-tenths of a second into the flight, the first of eight black puffs of smoke was emitted from the joint. The smoke was directed upwards, as if it were being forced up and out of the groove of the joint and the puffs roughly aligned with the normal vibration of the entire shuttle stack caused by the asymmetrical thrust imparted by the main engines. This smoke was visible because the cold O-rings had not sealed the joint fast enough, and hot gas rushed past them, eroding them away. And unlike on previous flights, the rings were damaged enough that they never did seal. The joint was now open, and gas could make its way through. 3.3 seconds into the flight, the smoke was no longer visible. Around 40 seconds after liftoff, as we discussed last time, Challenger encountered severe wind shear conditions. The wind shear forces put strain on the structure of the stack, causing it to bend and flex slightly. But since it was well within tolerances, the SSMEs and SRBs were able to pivot their thrust, keeping the spacecraft on target. At 59 seconds into the flight, Just before reaching the period of maximum dynamic pressure, the first evidence of flame outside the right-hand SRB was observed. Within two seconds, it had developed into a well-defined plume coming from the region of the aft field joint. A second later, telemetry noted the start of diverging pressures between the right-hand and left-hand boosters. By 61 seconds, the plume, deflected by the rushing air outside, was impinging on the bottom of the external tank. At 65 seconds, the plume began to change shape, indicating that the liquid hydrogen had begun to leak. Two seconds later, telemetry indicated that the hydrogen tank pressure began to drop, as Capcom radios the crew, Challenger, go at throttle up. At 70.2 seconds, telemetry showed diverging motion between the two SRBs. This is because the structure holding the right-hand SRB to the external tank had failed, allowing the bottom of the booster to swing out, pivoting along its upper external tank connection. A fifth of a second later, the SRB nozzles were commanded to use their highest rates, and the shuttle main engines commanded a roll of 5 degrees per second, 
all in an attempt by the computer to counteract the anomalous forces. At 73.12 seconds, just over 11 seconds after the plume first impinged on the external tank, the tank's aft dome failed. This caused an enormous rush of pressurized hydrogen out of the bottom of the tank, propelling the tank upwards into the bottom of the oxygen tank. At the same time, the top of the right-hand SRB swung into the intertank, the space between the hydrogen and oxygen tank. At this point, the liquid oxygen tank failed. At 73.19 seconds, there was a flash between the orbiter and the external tank. The clouds of hydrogen and oxygen mixed, and a fireball erupted. This is sort of splitting hairs, but I want to say that while the hydrogen and oxygen burned, there was no explosion, no detonation. Challenger did not explode. At 73.5 seconds, unaware of the greater context, the main engines reacted to the lower propellant pressures by issuing an emergency shutdown. 74.13 seconds into the mission, the last radio signal was received from Challenger. As the orbiter was subjected to aerodynamic forces far in excess of its design loads, the structure began to come apart. At 3 minutes and 25 seconds, the first pieces of debris were seen splashing down into the ocean. It was over, and the crew and vehicle were gone. There are several questions that might come to mind that I will try to address. If blow-by happens while the joint is flexing during ignition, why did the plume start so late? Why didn't Challenger just blow up right on the pad? Actually, some of the folks who fought to delay Challenger's launch, who we'll be hearing from next time, expected exactly that to happen. Nobody's totally sure why the field joint began to leak in earnest so late. One possibility is that the leak simply started off very small and built over time, hitting a tipping point a minute into the flight. But what seems to be the commonly accepted reason is the potential for an aluminum oxide plug. In short, residue from the burning propellant could have temporarily plugged the gap in the field joint. It had been observed when O-rings were deliberately damaged in testing. And since the development of the plume roughly correlated with the intense wind shear forces, the plug theory makes sense to me. The bending and flexing of the structure as it experienced the wind shear could have popped the plug out, allowing the gases to escape and grow the leak. Could the crew have done anything? No. Ascents are largely automated, with the commander and pilot mostly monitoring their systems rather than directly controlling them. We've seen occasional departures from that norm, such as the abort to orbit on STS-51F, or the helium leak troubleshooting on the previous flight, STS-61C, but these were definitely atypical. The forces are so great and the time scales are so small that ascent is really the realm of computer systems. Even if the pilot crew somehow suspected what was happening, there was nothing they could have done. While it was technically physically possible to separate the solid rocket boosters early, doing so would certainly have destroyed the spacecraft. The big trade-off with SRBs is that once they're lit, you can't do much about a problem other than ride it out. Sort of counterintuitively in retrospect, some saw this almost as an asset at first. If a problem with the main engines developed, a scenario considered far more likely, the simple and reliable SRBs could be counted on to give the orbiter much needed speed and altitude, buying time to try to come up with a solution. And this wasn't some SRB salesman saying this. I first saw that idea coming from the father of mission control, Chris Kraft. What if the crew had pressure suits and parachutes? Could they have escaped? Maybe, but probably not. I don't have anything official to base this on, this is just me speculating. As we'll learn, later shuttle crews did launch in pressure suits and were equipped with parachutes and a system for bailing out of the hatch. But that system was designed for a scenario where the shuttle was in a stable glide, but was unable to land on a runway. Again, I don't want to dwell on details like this, but the Challenger's crew would have had to navigate a weightless and tumbling cabin that was lit only by sun spilling through the gyrating windows. It's possible, but I don't think it's likely. What if the plume hadn't impinged on the external tank? Yeah, I wondered this one myself for a long time. I imagined a scenario where a large plume formed facing away from the rest of the shuttle structure, 
and shaken engineers immediately redesigned the joint as they considered how close they had come to disaster. But no, it actually wouldn't have made a difference. At the time that the external tank was in the process of disintegrating, the right-hand SRB's chamber pressure was 19 PSI lower than the left's, due to the growing hole through the field joint. If 19 PSI doesn't sound like much, it is, amounting to tens of thousands of pounds of thrust. On a normal flight, the SRBs would burn for almost another minute past this point. With the diverging pressures of the two boosters, disaster was inevitable, no matter where the plume was directed. Why this flight? The answer to this is simple. It was too cold to launch. The previous coldest launch, STS-51C, had lifted off into a 53-degree sky. That's already unusually cold for Florida, and it did suffer blow-by. At the time of the STS-51L launch, the air was 36 degrees Fahrenheit, and it had been much colder the night before. In fact, for reasons that weren't entirely clear, according to the temperature measurements at the pad shortly before launch, the aft section of the right-hand SRB was significantly colder than even the already frigid ambient temperature, plummeting down to single digits. I've seen speculation that the aerodynamics of the shuttle structure on the pad caused the unusual cooling as wind rushed by the large cylindrical objects. In any case, the SRBs, and specifically the O-rings, were much colder than any previous launch. And as we learned earlier, it's critical that the O-rings were sufficiently pliable that they were able to move to the correct position in their slot and then extrude into the gap, completing the seal. With temperatures this cold, the rubber was just too stiff, and it just took a little too long to form a seal. Could anything have been done to prevent the field joint failure? Sure, and work was progressing on this front. For the last couple of years, new lighter SRBs that took advantage of carbon fiber filament had been developed for use on the west coast. When launching into a polar orbit, the shuttle wouldn't be able to get a little boost from the rotation of the Earth, so lighter SRBs were required to reach orbit. The filament-wound casing SRBs were fairly similar overall, but if you were to take a close look at the field joints, you would notice a key difference the capture feature. Without rehashing the entire structure description again, this essentially made it so that both the top and the bottom of the SRBs had two prongs. So rather than a ridge slotting into a groove, it was almost like a handshake. The capture feature helped resist the joint flexing, keeping the seal intact. Such a feature could be introduced to the normal SRB, but that takes a lot of time and effort and these things don't happen overnight. Plus, while the O-ring issue was known, most people were unaware of their catastrophic potential. But there were plenty of other things that could have prevented the accident. The undesirable joint rotation was known as early as 1977, four years before the shuttle first launched, and could have been redesigned. As early as STS-2, O-ring damage had been observed on returned SRBs. And on numerous other flights, joints came home with O-ring erosion and soot between the rings. It was known in some corners of the sprawling shuttle organization that the rings did not react well to low temperatures, and it would be best to wait. And when the keepers of that knowledge spoke up, they could have been listened to. So, why didn't any of those things happen? How was it that this disaster was allowed to take place? <sighs> well, that's the big one, and one that doesn't have an easy answer. So far, we've talked about mechanisms and chemistry and aerodynamics and physics. You gather the data, you analyze the telemetry, you sample the debris, and you scrutinize the imagery. As complex as all the technical details of the accident are, at the end of the day, they have a clear-cut answer. The aft field joint of the right-hand SRB failed due to cold O-rings that were unable to properly seal the joint. Period. What's harder to analyze is the people involved in the accident. Why were some people listened to and others not? Why was a design flaw allowed to linger for nine years? Why didn't the right people have the key information they needed to call off the launch? And why did an aerospace contractor first recommend against the launch before changing their minds? There is no formula that can answer these questions. There is no telemetry coming from their brains. And there's no way to see what their true intent and understanding really was. But next time, we'll give it a shot. 
So far in our coverage of STS-51L, we've talked about what should have happened, and now what did happen. Next time, we'll try to understand why it happened. We'll try to understand how despite all the hard-working, well-intentioned people, the procedures and the safeguards, the one thing everyone was working to prevent still happened. We'll also look at the investigation process and how we know any of this in the first place. And we'll try to learn the lessons, pick up the pieces, and continue on. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.